Kia kato katoa. Now my hari mai. Welcome everyone to the very first Australian Evaluation Society um, seminar for 2023. Um, we are very lucky to have Professor Janet Stephenson here today, introducing um, the, using the energy cultures framework to guide evaluation interventions and practice. And as you can tell right now, this seminar is recorded. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, feel free to turn off your cameras. Um, this will be uploaded in about two weeks. Um, you can find most of our seminars at the AES, um, AES website on YouTube. I'm quite happy to send you the link along with the slides that um, Janet shares today. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands which we all come from. I come from Ponake, Wellington, Aotearoa, and I acknowledge the leaders past, present and emerging. Today, we are so fortunate to hear from Professor Janice Stephenson about her work related to energy related practices. Janet is a research professor at the Center for Sustainability, University of Otago, um, which she undertook the role of director for over a decade. The Center of Sustainability is an interdisciplinary research center that specializes in research related environmental issues locally and globally. Janice has a background in sociology, planning, and cultural geography, and she has led multiple research programs, too many to mention here, um, and is widely published and serves on several energy related advisory groups in Aotearoa and internationally. Janet, thank you so much um, for being here today. It is lovely to have you, and we are all looking forward to um, learning from you. For anyone who is participating, feel free to um, send any questions um, in the chat function. I will monitor it, um, but we will also have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end that you can um, unmute yourself and ask Janet anything you want um, towards the end of the seminar. So thank you, and over to you, Janet. Uh, kia ora koutou and thank you Marie uh, nga mihinui kia koutou. Uh, it's really lovely to be here today with you and um, sh to share just ho hopefully a few insights from the work that we've undertaken um, and that's been uh, adopted quite widely internationally that, that hopefully will help you as evaluators think about when we're measuring the effectiveness of an intervention, how do we decide what to measure, what to evaluate? And in this talk, I'm going to introduce what we now call the cultures framework, moving on from the energy cultures framework, because it's very applicable to many topics, not just energy. So applying the cultures framework as an analytical lens for assisting um, with the design of evaluations. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this is all going to work okay. And we can go from there. So Marie, is that visible to everybody? That is perfect. Thanks, right. Shana. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is in five parts. I'm going to introduce culture and then talk about, oh, the, first of all, introducing the concept of culture and then talk about investigating culture in relation to outcomes. Um, I'm then going to introduce the cultures framework, um, which links culture to outcomes. Then I'm going to talk about policy and other interventions as being an attempt to change cultures. Um, and then I'm finally going to talk about the evaluation of interventions using the cultures framework as a framing for those evaluations. But first of all, I just want to pay pay homage to the, the Energy Cultures team who I worked with um, from 2009 to 2016. As you can see, it was an incredibly varied uh, disciplinary team. Um, the, the, the one in the left-hand photograph are the, the initial team, and then in a, in a further project, a whole lot of other people got added. So in a sense, Although it, it was developed 14 years ago, it was at that stage it was to support integrated research on energy-related behaviours, but it has since been applied internationally in research and policy across a wide range of fields, not just energy, but many other topics as well, as, as you'll see. 
Um, and it's been used as a research framework in over 100 applications um, around the world that have been published in academic journals and, and theses and maybe other applications I'm not aware of. Um, and what it is, is, it is particularly useful for unpicking why change can be so hard for households, businesses and organisations. And also how and why change, when change occurs, why, why it does. And most studies using the framework have used it to gain policy insights, but in, in light of an evaluation, a number of studies have used it to examine the success or otherwise of policy or other interventions which purposefully set out to achieve different outcomes. So this was a holistic approach which started, as you can see in this frame here, as an attempt to provide an integrating framework across behavioural theory, spanning psychology, management, sociology, anthropology, consumer psychology, behavioural economics and others. And it still works in that sort of multidisciplinary integrating sense, but more importantly, it works analytically as a framework in its own right, a framework that's open for use with multiple theories and multiple methods of inquiry. So we started writing about it in 2010 in this paper here in Energy Policy, and, and since then there have been numerous papers and, and reports that have used the Energy Cultures Framework, um, and this was is one of the more recent ones, um, which is moving it away from just focusing on energy to looking at the relationship between cultural attributes and sustainable out, sustainability outcomes. So if you're interested in any backup um, papers or, or reading, um, there's a lot out there to access. So let's try and climb into this talk. What do we mean by culture? Well, when we look at the social realm, we, we usually think of it both in terms of the fact that we all have some generic human characteristics. We need food, we need warmth, we need caring relationships. On the other hand, we're all unique individuals. We have unique genetics, we have unique personalities. But, but in between those two extremes of the, of the collective and the individual, we actually share many characteristics that are similar to others in our families, in our social groups, in our workplaces, in our ethnic groups, within our countries, and so forth. And we call this culture. So we often think about culture as being, well, actually, when I ask people what culture means, they have lots of different answers. But generally, people say, well, doesn't it mean we kind of share similar values or beliefs or um, have similar ideas about things um, and maybe we carry out similar kinds of practices mm. and, and they kind of get lost about there. I'm going to give you a little bit more structure around that. So it is definitely about the ways that people think. It is also about what we do and it is also about what we have. And importantly, it is about how those things are interlinked and feed off and support each other. And we call this the cultural ensemble. And as academics, we like to give things fancy names. So instead of have, think and do, we talk about materiality, um, motivators and activities. So specifically, cultural features may include many things like in terms of materiality, products, tools, technologies, infrastructure, artifacts, the food we eat, and so forth. In terms of activities, it can include direct actions, doing, making, using, acquiring, behaving, performing, and routines, habits, practices, rituals, and repeated behaviors. In terms of motivators, things that 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 we share with others that that actually affect how and why we carry out activities and what kind of material items we, we, we undertake um, and use. Things like norms, values, beliefs, knowledge and symbolism and meanings are all important motivators in the decisions that we make and what we do with our lives, which may be visible to us, we may be aware of them, or we may be not consciously aware of these within our, our thought processes. So when we talk about culture, we talk about cultural ensembles, which are interrelated cultural features. So the way that these things relate to each other. And here's an example, um, a phone, a mobile phone, a relatively new um, item of materiality in human society. So a technology 
that's associated with a number of motivators. So it has become entirely normalized within particular societies built around expectations, rules of use, aspirations. It's associated with a whole lot of symbolism and meanings. Um, so it, it indicates certain things about who we are and, and particularly what kind of phone we have might, might have a, a lot of messages hidden behind it. It's, it's involved with forms of knowledge and understandings about how to use it um, and how, how the use of it might affect um, other people, um, for example, in relation to social media. Um, a number of activities are also associated with it in, in terms of acquiring, using, and the sorts of routines or habits we have in terms of that use. And the fact that we have an iPhone may well lead to new aspirations for other technologies that are associated with iPhones, such as here, the speaker. So here we are, this is just a picture of what I mean by when we call, talk about a cultural ensemble. So my, my definition of, of culture um, is that it is distinctive patterns of motivators, of activities and materiality that form dynamic ensembles, which are shared by a group of people and learned through both cognitive and bodily processes. So these features of a cultural ensemble may be consciously shared, um, for example, teenagers being incredibly conscious about um, the clothes that they wear or the, or the hairstyles that they've got, um, or they may be unconsciously shared. We may not even be particularly aware that we are um, uh, acting culturally, maybe until we go somewhere else where there is a different culture, and then it'll suddenly hit us that our cultural, our expectations, our practices, our beliefs, our understandings are quite different to others. And by, de by dynamic, I mean that these cultural features relate to and influence each other. And we can see varied cultural ensembles across any given society. Um, and I'm going to dig a bit more deeply into that as we go through this talk. But what culture is, what those ensembles consist of, depends on what your particular focus is. And where we're going with this talk is, is taking an outcomes focus on culture. So what are the cultural ensembles that give rise to particular outcomes? And this symbol in the middle here is one I use to remind us that when we're talking about outcomes, we may be talking about um, environmental outcomes, we may be talking about social and health outcomes, and we may be talking about economic outcomes or others. Example here of, of, of varied uh, cultural ensembles across a, a, a population. This is um, some findings from a research project that was part of the Energy Cultures um, research, where um, a national household survey identified four types of, of household ensembles that relate to different levels of energy efficiency. One we called energy economical, who had absolutely appalling um, material culture, really inefficient houses, dreadful heating systems, but very, very efficient energy practices. So trying to save as much money as possible. Energy efficient, who had very efficient material culture, very efficient energy practices. Energy extravagant, um, people who had not particularly good um, material culture and not particularly good energy practices, but often were very high users of energy and energy easy, who probably had um, were more laid back about their practices, but had very efficient material culture. Each of those had quite different outcomes in terms of efficiency. And there have been other studies as well that have, have, have actually um, I looked across populations to identify similar patterns. So when we look at culture in relation to outcomes, it gives us a different perspective on culture to what you might typically think about of as, as culture in your day-to-day -day lives. So as an evaluator, if we take an outcomes focus, what is it that you're seeking to measure? Is it water quality in streams? Is it asthma rates amongst children? Is it greenhouse gas em emissions from transport? Is it rates of energy poverty, um, et cetera? So from an outcomes focus looking at culture, the question then is who are the actors that this particular intervention has sought to influence? This is assuming that, that there is an intervention that has sought to improve one of these, um, these measures. So is it farmers, is it households, is it commuters, is it landlords? 
And then the question becomes, what is, what are the, the cultural ensembles? What are the, the combinations of materiality, motivators and activities that are giving rise to or are associated with those outcomes? So what cultural features in particular are relevant to those outcomes? Example here of, of different heating cultures. Here's a kind of a typical student flat in Dunedin, probably appalling heating systems because their landlords can't be bothered to give them a, a heat pump, um, wrapping themselves up in blankets and hotties in order to keep warm and, and not particularly worried about the temperature of their house because they've got other things to, to spend their money and time doing. Um, and they probably have a high rate of chest infections. In fact, they do. Um, Whereas um, here's a different heating culture, um, a, a household with, with, with a heat pump, a household that has, has curtains and draws them at night to keep the warmth in and carries out other activities and has an expectation of being warm and, and that is associated with a whole lot of meanings and values in their lives and probably um, having a much lower level of chest infections. So that's just a simple example of showing you that how, how I'm talking about the relationship between cultural ensembles and the outcomes from those. So the starting point for, for any evaluation is, is, is really to say what features of cultural ensembles are associated with the outcome that I'm interested in, or maybe which cultural ensembles across this population give better or worse outcomes. Into, I'm putting those in quote marks because um, yeah, the better or worse is, is probably from the position of assuming there has been a policy intervention to change some particular outcomes. So just picking up now on the cultures framework, which, which moves from this idea of culture to give it a little bit more complexity in order to help us unpick these relationships between culture and outcomes. So the cultures framework is an actor-centered framework, by which I mean it can apply to any actor or group of actors at any scale. It can apply to an individual or a group of individuals. We can apply it to a family or a household or a group of families. We can apply it to small businesses. We can apply it to, to major businesses or collectives of businesses or, or sectors or, or government agencies. So the, the framework as a whole, those sets of key ideas here are applicable at any scale. The next element I want to introduce is this idea of agency. So having choice and having the ability to act on that choice. So this dotted line around the outside of these items says the ones that we are particularly interested in when we are evaluating is what is within the actor's realm of influence. How extensive is the agency? Can they change these things or can they not? And these agencies constraints may be things like income, education, power, relative power compared to others, the de degree of wellness that that person or that family has. An agency can be reduced by the actor's situation. For example, tenants have very little agency over the materiality of their, of their lives. Their homes um, and often the heating systems are determined by the choices that their landlord makes, not themselves. And this constrains the kinds of activities that they can carry out and constrains some ele elements about how they can think about their, their situation. The second idea I want to introduce here is that of external influences. So beyond the cultural ensemble, beyond the actor's um, realm of influence, there are a whole lot of things out there, the broader context, which is influencing their cultural ensemble and influencing the degree of agency they have. And some of those external influences support the status quo. They are tending to hold that pattern of cultural ensemble in one place and some external influences are driving change and we tend to be interested in both of those. There are other influences that are probably not influential particularly so we want to try and pinpoint what these influences are that are holding this particular cultural ensemble in place 
preventing change or those ones that are tending to drive change. Um, and just as an example, um, if we look at commuting culture, the fact that, that many people still rely on their, their private cars to get to and from work, what's holding that in place, those patterns of material investment motivators and, and activities? Well, one thing is invest, continued investment in motorways. Another is car advertising. Another is policies on urban form. And I'm sure you could come up with a whole lot more as well. The final element of, of the culture's framework is about outcomes. So when we look at outcomes, um, it is what are the outcomes of this combination of the cultural ensembles that people have interplaying with their degree of agency and interplaying with those external influences. This reminds us that there isn't, for any intervention for change, there's never going to be a direct line of dominoes between that intervention and the outcome you're seeking. People aren't rational actors. They're not just motivated by money or values. Their ability to change one aspect of their lives, for example, to, um, to stop by using their car and start walking, is constrained by the existence of other existing material items, other activities, their values, beliefs, and norms, and also the limits to what they can realistically change. And those cultural ensembles, as I said, are also supported by these external influences belong beyond their control. All of these things are entangled and influential. So rather than a line of dominoes from an intervention to an outcome that you can evaluate, we have a system which is entangled and complex to change. What the culture's framework can help us do is unpick that system. So what we see policy as is, is or other interventions, I'm, I'm positing here that, that when we try and intervene in a situation to get a different outcome, we can see it as an attempt to change elements of culture. So interventions aim to change one or more of these things in terms of materiality, in terms of activities, or in terms of motivators at one or more scales. So here's an example of policy to, to change outcomes. Here comes a policy intervention. It seeks to change possibly an external influence, maybe alternatively, it seeks to change the degree of agency that people have. Maybe it seeks to ch achieve a material change within the group of actors. Maybe it seeks to, to change a motivator. And a lot of um, policy interventions are all about improving knowledge. So it is about um, information campaigns. Um, or it may be directly to try and adjust an activity, for example, a nudge campaign. And ultimately, there's an attempt to achieve a change in an outcome. Um, an example, just to bring that to life, um, improving home energy performance. So we might want to improve energy, home energy performance in, in order to get a number of outcomes, an increase in indoor temperatures, a reduction in humility, oh, sorry, humidity, and, and less doctor's visits, less, less sickness in, in the family, and maybe a number of other measurable outcomes as well. So a policy intervention um, in terms of its external influences might um, introduce minimum perf performance levels for rental housing. It might um, seek to improve agency by offering heating and insulation subsidies. It might seek to improve materiality by direct action in terms of adding insulation to homes or, or putting in heating system upgrades as a number of programs within this country are already doing. It might seek to change motivators by um, running information campaigns to improve understanding about heat retention and the causes of dampness, or it might seek to normalize the expectations that, that people should have warm, dry homes. Or it might seek to, to adjust people's activities so that they are better at retaining warmth in their homes, for example, drawing curtains at night or ventilating spaces in order to, to reduce moisture. 
So if we look at policy interventions in that sense, in relation to outcomes, they can work at one or several of those elements of the culture's framework. Um, a couple of, of examples here um, from some work that one of our PhD students did looking at energy poverty um, using the, the energy cultures framework. And here are a couple of uh, different families um, in relation to this energy poverty study. Norma, um, um, a, a, a pseudonym who had a partner and two children. Um, she was in a rental accommodation, had limited income and, and obviously limited agency. Her house lost the sun early, it was poorly built, it lacked insulation, and she had a portable electric heater in terms of materiality. In terms of her motivators, she was really careful about energy spending. She knew how to be frugal and efficient, and she just wanted a warmer, healthier house. And in terms of activities, she carried out everything she possibly could in order to reduce energy use and keep as warm as they could within those limitations. In terms of that, particular family, the ideal intervention would be to make material changes to the house. If we then look at a different family, Eric, a homeowner, a single father with a four-year-old child who kept getting sick, he, he had insulated what he could, but he couldn't do the ceiling. He had a wood burner, he cut the firewood, um, he, he lit the fire, but his main response to being cold was to put more clothes on. He was, and he was accustomed to being cold since a student and frugality was a, a way of life. He was very accepting of cold. So in order to, to introduce an, a, a, an intervention into this situation, maybe the best um, intervention would be to improve his understanding of the links between cold and damp and his child's health. So what I'm saying here is that by understanding the, the, the variety of, of cultural ensembles within one even one particular outcome that we're concerned about, there might be a variety of different appropriate interventions according to what those cultures um, reveal. Sometimes an intervention can have unintended consequences. And I'm gonna tell a, a, a story here about some work um, that was carried out in South Chile, where most households in, this, in the area that was studied here have these traditional firewood cook stoves. And the aim of the, of the intervention was to reduce outdoor air pollution um, because there wasn't a lot of wind in, in, in this town and um, it was very um, polluted outside. So a lot of particulate matter from the wood stoves. So they brought in this program to replace these old efficient, inefficient firewood appliances and to undertake thermal retrofits to improve the building envelope. But the cultural context was, was, was an interesting one in that those wood stoves supported multiple activities and multiple needs for heating, for baking bread, for boiling water, for drying clothes, and for drying the dwelling. And it was a known technology that they could fix and maintain in their own right. And in terms of motivators, these were part of their tradition. They, were, they had a whole lot of social attachments. They, they, they were associated with family and, and, and memories. And, and they gave a sort of this sense of comfort and togetherness. There's a, there's a phrase that they had um, essentially meaning the, the snugness of being around the fire. So when they carried out this, um, this intervention, um, as I mentioned before, um, oh, one other thing was that in terms of that wider context, firewood was a lot cheaper than the pallets or kerosene stoves, which were part of the, of the replacement process. And what happened? Well, there were unintended consequences. There was powerful resistance to change. People resold their new appliances and, and put their old stoves back in again. And ironically, indoor air pollution increased because the building envelopes were less leaky and therefore um, held in the particulate matter inside. So where the program intended to reduce outdoor air pollution, it actually ended up increasing indoor air pollution. So I'm now going to move through to the topic, which hopefully is of most interest to you, which is how do we evaluate interventions using the cultures framework? Um, so in terms of using the framework, 
my contention is that all interventions, whether they're a, a, a policy intervention, i.e. an intervention that is introduced by a policy agency, or it might be an intervention that's carried out by an NGO or, or any other organisation or even at a community level, um, all interventions seek to change one or more of these elements here. They seek to change motivators, they seek to change activities, they must seek to change materiality, or they seek to change agency. That is the ability of people to make free choices and act on those. The framework can be used as an evaluation tool regardless of whether an, an intervention that you're measuring was consciously designed with the cultural framing or not. It has been used um, quite frequently to evaluate interventions of various sorts that were not undertaken in relation to this kind of cultural framing, but this framing helped understand how and why that intervention was successful or not. And importantly, it's suitable for use for, with multiple evaluation methods and indicators, um, and it suits the use of both qualitative and quantitative measures. I'm going to show you some examples um, in, this, in this part of the talk. And I just want to introduce these words proximal and distal changes to you just to, um, because I think it's quite useful. Often as evaluators, I think we tend to focus on what are the outcome measures? And I call these distal changes. So they're changes to the outcome sought by the intervention, which might relate to energy or health or water quality or anything else. But within that, there's a whole lot of what I call proximal changes. And these are the direct changes to materiality, motivators, activities, or agency. And they might be a direct result of the intervention, or they might be a consequential result. And I'll talk about some of those in a minute. And again, measurable qualitatively or quantitatively. We also can see feedback loops. So changed outcomes, and this is why this um, arrow is a double-ended one here. So although we often think about the, um, the impact of an intervention flowing through cultural change into different outcomes, it can also act the other way. So some, for example, if we had a farmer, there was some kind of policy intervention that forced a farmer to start fencing his waterways, keeping his stock out of the water, maybe doing some planting either side of the stream. But then maybe that outcome of improved water quality actually had some other longer term changes on that farmer's um, motivators. So maybe seeing his children playing in the streams maybe the fact that he could now catch fish in the streams, maybe the fact that, that his neighbours and, and people who came and swam in the waterhole um, down the stream of it kept telling him what a good job he'd done. Maybe some of those things led to further changes in terms of his motivators, um, his material interventions and his activities. Maybe he decided to put in much, much um, more extensive planting, for example, to protect the, the upstream uh, water quality um, for, for, for downstream users. So just be aware that, that, that these consequential changes can continue over time. I'm going to tell you a, a, an, an example of a, a really interesting study that was undertaken in Ireland using the, the, the cultures framework. And, and the, this was to do with an intervention that aim to reduce electricity and gas consumption and create water home, warmer homes in a social house, a, a bunch of social housing um, within Ireland. So they set out in this instance to formally evaluate before and after the retrofit. So what did they evaluate? Well, in terms of outcomes, they were interested in daily average gas and electricity consumption. They were interested in average indoor temperatures, um, the time spent less at less than thermal comfort level, so how long was the, the house cold for, and any visible mould. Typical things that you would measure. But they also measured other things. They, they measured a number of um, aspects to do with dwelling characteristics, heating devices, and so forth. They measured a whole lot of activities before and after, how people operated their space of water heating, how often they used key appliances, how long they heated for, 
what their ventilation practices for what kind of appliances they, they used. And they also looked at, at a number of motivators such as perceived comfort levels, perceptions of appliances, their aspirations and environmental attitudes. So the intervention was undertaken, included wall and ceiling insulation, double glazing, ventilation systems, and new heating systems that had thermostats. But it didn't quite work. There were unintended consequences. There were lower than expected improvements in warmth and savings. What this analysis enabled them to see was, was that this was due to, to other aspects of people's energy cultures and and part of that was they were carrying through frugality ideas from their previous lives and they had a lack of understanding about how to operate those the new technologies they undertook inefficient routines they lacked the skills to operate systems and they often manually overrode the thermostats um, in order to to um, align with their ideas of frugality so this obviously then had some implications for, for recommendations for changes to the approach that might be undertaken for any future interventions. So in terms of deciding what to evaluate, um, pre-intervention, if you can, um, ideally you would set up um, measures of the outcomes that the intervention sought to achieve, the cultural features that are relevant to that outcome that have a, a direct relationship to that, and any limitations in the actor's agency. And also don't forget that there may be external influences that are tending to drive or to prevent change. They may also affect the success of the intervention. Um, an example here from a study, um, in fact, uh, of, that was undertaken of the US Navy energy culture in this wonderful paper called, How Many Admirals Does It Take to Change a Light Bulb? Um, was seeking to understand why the Navy had been um, had had almost zero success in attempts over, I think, about 12 years to introduce energy efficient lighting into their ships. And one of the big barriers to, to that was this, this, these broader external influences that were tending to lock Navy energy culture um, into a, a certain pattern of behaviours that it was very, very hard to break out of. And then post-intervention, um, obviously, again, changes in the outcomes of what the intervention sought to achieve, changes in cultural features that are relevant to the outcome, and changes in the actor's agency. Bear in mind, though, that the consequences of any intervention can be far greater than what you anticipate. And I want to finish with one final story, um, and this is in Vanuatu. So here there was... A, um, a situation where there were the villages, there was there was no very, very little in the way of reticulated light um, energy, so no 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 mains power. Um, and people generally relied on these um, these lamps to to light their homes. The intervention was from Australia Aid, who um, applied a supply side subsidy for NGOs to to provide these um, solar lamps at a cheaper price than would usually be the case. So what, what happened, and this was an incredibly rapid transformation across Vanuatu, which was far greater than, than AusAid ever imagined. So solar lamps started to replace kerosene lamps in people's homes. What that led to was a whole lot of changes in activities. Women and children started using lamps previously they very rarely used the, the old um, um, kerosene lamps because they were dangerous and expensive. New evening practices um, started to evolve with children weaving, children, uh, women weaving, children doing homework. It support, they supported social interactions. People could take lights out to go fishing at night. And there was less need for the families to engage in the cash economy because they didn't have to go and buy kerosene. This was also associated with a whole lot of changes in terms of, of motivators. Suddenly light was for everybody and sunlight was, was, is from God, it's free energy and it is, it is something that is incredibly trustworthy compared to kerosene. This is a, a, a poster um, from, from Vanuatu. 
um, and, and a stronger version to kerosene um, started emerging. And that led to aspirations for more solar related um, um, technologies such as solar panels, phones and chargers. And what was notable here was how quickly this spread of different forms of lighting spread across the islands and how quickly these other changes started to occur. So it's a great example of how an intervention can have more than anticipated um, and, um, um, outcomes. So here we go, the, 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 the culture's framework. It is a framework, it is not a method, <clears throat> but it is a framework for thinking about the relationship between an intervention and an outcome and the elements that might be useful to evaluate as an evaluator. So it invites you to evaluate change in cultural elements, which enables a holistic assessment of the impacts of an intervention, rather than just looking at it uh, as, as in terms of, of one or two, or not having a particular method for choosing which elements to, to evaluate. It assists you to think about a more holistic approach. It also points to the importance of evaluating change in agency um, to assist in understanding how and why constraints, these kind of constraints may be a factor in the effectiveness of an intervention. Evaluating those outcome measures allows us to focus on the ultimate intent of the intervention and evaluating both the proximal and distal changes allows assess assessment of both those direct and indirect impacts. It also helps us identify unintended consequences, either for, in terms of the outcomes or in terms of change in culture, as we saw with the Vanuatu example. Finally, this is a, a, a wee shameless plug. Um, I've, I've written a book um, called Culture and Sustainability, Exploring Stability and Transformation with the Cultures Framework, which is actually due to be published online towards the end of next week and will be available in terms of hard copies from around the 22nd of April, um, and it will be free to download. It's an open access book. And um, there's a whole chapter here about using the culture's framework um, in relation to policy, which includes its use for evaluation, um, and another chapter which focuses on its, its use um, in terms of a, a research approach. And that's the end of my talk. Um, and we've got 15 minutes left for questions. So I will Janet, point stop. to stop my share. Janet, thank you so much. That, that was a brilliant, fascinating presentation with um, plenty of illustrative quest, um, case studies. I can see there's one hand up and one question in the chat, but I'm going to be selfish and ask the first question <laughs> just to get it in. Um, I just have a hypothetical question for you especially referring to your study in Ireland, the social housing in Ireland, um, hypothetically say that um, it was impossible to collect data pre-intervention. Post-intervention, um, how, would, how would you determine the um, previous state? Would you ask people's subjective op opinions of what it was like before for you? Yes, yes. So some studies have done that um, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't, didn't quote any in here, um, but there have been studies that have, have looked at, at basically just from a post-intervention point and generally um, interviews with, with participants and um, interviews with um, also like policy professionals and NGOs who work with these people are also often involved. So whatever sources you can find to establish what was the, the, the pre-intervention situation, um, in a post-intervention um, evaluation. Thank you so much. I'm just going to unmute um, Seno. Um, would you like to? Would you like to ask Janet a question? You have your hand up. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the background noise. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I wanted to ask, uh, how do we use this framework for, you know, an NGO? Are there any specific resources that, you know, um, that you could provide us or guide us towards that using this framework, you know, to troubleshoot or have interventions for small organizations like, you know, community health organizations? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And... 
what what I will say is is that it has been used in a I guess by NGOs as a as a framing for helping them think about interventions in the first place, and and, and they have found it very useful because often we don't we don't tend to think in a very structured way about about interventions, and this helps give a structure around. Um, always reminding us that that if we're looking at a material intervention, there will also be other aspects of culture that that may well be affected by that material change or maybe maybe even more important to to work with than the one that we immediately leap to. So that's that's one thing I would suggest. And the other thing is that for NGOs, so yeah, that that study in Ireland, for example, I mean that was that was, that was funded as a research project um, and it was quite comprehensive. You saw all the things that were measured in that one. You don't have to measure so many things, but I think it's important to think about maybe one or two key things you can measure in terms of each of those elements. So um, if you're um, looking to improve health and you've got you know maybe a, an intervention in terms of a, a material item then then one or two measures to do with what are the changes in activities that relate to that material item what are the some of the uh, one or two changes in terms of of key key motivators so will it, is it in terms of you know, people's expectations about warmth that changes it is it levels of knowledge is it um, certain beliefs um, that are you know holding people back those sorts of things and, and each case will be obviously really different and and if you're working closely with communities you will know you will get a you'll have a really good sense of what some of those might be um, so so in fact your your gut feeling as a as a someone who works closely with people is is a really important thing to to trust uh, thank you so much thanks a lot we have two um, similar questions in the chat section. David is asking how this approach fits into the practice of Elizabeth Shell. Um, David, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask Janet directly, that would be great. Well, well I'm, I'm familiar with practice theory, if that's and it's clearly yeah that's that's, yeah. that's what it's about i've just read it, some of her work and I, I see some similarities so i just wondered if you'd like to comment on that yeah yeah and i, I have written quite extensively on this so so practice theory is 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 certain is is one approach that that gets at some of these issues in a slightly similar way the difference, one of the key differences is that practice theory focuses on practices. That is, it, it focuses on regularized routines within people's lives. And, and, the, and the focus is very much the exploration of practices in their own right, but as maybe related to um, norms, expectations, materiality, and so forth. What the practice theory also is not particularly structured about is some of the other elements that I'm laying out here. So, so it doesn't take a particularly structured approach to thinking about agency or to, or to considering external influences or necessarily to this, this sort of um, the outcomes focus that I'm talking about. So practices become the core of the focus um, and indeed practices are are almost seen in some practice theory as having a life of their own. They they invite participants. They 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 continue to exist regardless of whether people essentially are pulled into them or maybe drop out of them. So, as I said, I've, I've written quite extensively about the difference between practice theory and, and this approach. It, it's a valuable theory. It can be used in association with the cultures framework, and in fact has been and is one of. But but there are other many other theories of behavior or or social change um, that are also relevant to helping us examine aspects of what I'm trying to lay out here with the cultures framework. Thanks, Janet. Um, there's a similar question by Rachel, um, who's asking for if 
if it's similar to a realist evaluation that, that focuses on mechanisms and outcomes? I've not heard of realist evaluation. I'm not an evaluator by trade or training, yeah. so that's I, not anything I'm familiar with. I can probably pitch in there, Rachel. I think it is. Um, I, I really think it is because um, it's collecting evidence through empirical data. So it's it's not really um, it's collecting real real um, evidential data instead of hypothetical assumption. So I really think there's um, a lot of similarities with realist evaluation. Um, we have a question on the RMA by Smirthy, um, who asks how this might be used in ongoing evaluatory processes under the Resource Management Act to anticipate socioeconomic impacts in consenting decisions. Smirthy, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to um, ask Janet directly. Hi, Sora, thanks, Janet. Um, so essentially, I guess um, the, the challenge is that I think when people are trying to sort of make decisions on what's the most appropriate um, um, next step based on sort of a current snapshot of, you know, what exists and you're trying to sort of make that assessment based on what you can see as likely impact. So this isn't necessarily an intervention that's already happened and you're trying to project forward. There are so many sort of, I guess, practical considerations that come into play. One is the timing, you know, it's highly time pressured, but it's also sort of, I guess, um, based on evidence that is supported from one, one, one um, source. If, if you know, this is speaking sort of generically, normally it's the person who wants the intervention, like the the, the new building or the new that that, that puts forward that value, the, the data. And I guess my question is. This framework seems to suggest sort of seems to assume a neutrality to where that information or the data is coming from to support that assessment. It's assuming that it's not um, motivated, if that's the word, or it's not it's not inherently um, biasing a certain outcome. But how, how do you see this playing out in in the real world where things are sort of really contested and messy and sort of and 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 um, and where data and information is not neutrally delivered to you as the person making a choice or a decision in your evaluation, if that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Um, thanks, Smithy. I mean, I must say I've never even thought about it in relation to the kinds of evaluation that are undertaken under the RMA. It's a it's a very different different situation, I think. Um, I mean, there, there it's often about a choice about whether to grant consent to something or not, not grant consent to something. I don't, I don't think this is applicable to that at all. Um, what, what this is about is a framework for, in, in, in this, in this instance, the way I'm presenting it here today is, is as a framework to help us think through a policy intervention or an intervention that is undertaken by at whatever level, by a community group, a, a government agency, you know, an, an NGO, uh, a, a Marae committee, to, to consciously try and get a, an improved outcome for, for a particular part of the population and to, to unpick what that process might mean in terms of changes to, you know, those cultural elements, as you understand. I think that's, that's kind of a different evaluation system situation to evaluations under the RMA, which I think are a very different kind of beast. Yeah, thanks, Janet. Janet, um, we have a question from Mel. Is there a Tao Maori perspective on the application of this framework? Is there a Tao Maori perspective? Is that what you said? Yeah. Mel, feel, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to elaborate. Yeah, is there a Tao Maori perspective? Just, just, a, just a question on um, the considerations of. Uh, uh, it's it's probably more relevant in the context of New Zealand, um, around how this framework has it been tested uh, for any project specifically looking at how Maori perceive culture and the implications of those interventions within their world 
and to what extent does this framework uh, fit into those perspectives? Mm. Um, it's yeah. To, I guess I can answer that in two ways. F first of all, in terms of I guess the the core ideas of of the elements of culture that is that's yeah. I've I've both I've received very positive feedback from from Mari who are, who I've discussed this with. I'm not aware of any specific applications, particularly to uh, like a Marai situation directly with this framework. But what I can say is that it has been applied um, to many different cultures across the world in many situations in third world countries and you know in first world countries in um you know Africa, South America, Asia. Um, it's kind of a it's a it's a, a universal set of ideas that is applicable anywhere. But in terms of its an example I can that I can quote of its direct application in a, a Maori only community, um, no I can't. I don't know about that. Um, it may have been um, but I'm not aware of it. Thanks, Janet. Phoebe, um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask Janet a question? Thank you. Hi, Janet. Um, I don't know if I can turn my camera on. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, I can't. So I'll just ask my question. Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. Um, and I've just mentioned that I, I have actually read um, about the framework before, but I definitely got more out of it listening to your talk. So I'm glad I came along today. Um, I, th I work in, um, I'm, I'm working at the moment in evaluating um, energy efficiency um, interventions. And um, I've seen in the literature that they're, they're, in this field, there's been quite a few projects that have had, and in fact, probably about half of the policies I've seen designed for energy efficiency improvements have had unintended consequences or, or possibly even more. And um, so it's, it, it really seems to me like that's one of the particular values from, from my perspective of your framework is giving some meaning around those unintended consequences, because often they're not sort of developed or gone into much as just to say, you know, you do read quite a few papers where it just said, oh, it didn't work quite like we expected. And that's it. <laughs> So I think that's a really valuable um, aspect of your framework there. And I was also thinking that, you know, longer term, the exciting thing from my point of view too, could be when enough projects have used the framework um, to do some kind of like meta analyses of those unintended consequences, particularly with relation to energy efficiency. And I was just wondering how close do you think it has, that, have we got had enough projects using it yet to start, start looking across those kind of things? To, to, to an extent. So, so in, in the book, um, I have done a bit of a meta-analysis across lots of uses of the framework. Um, but what I was focusing on there was, was how, how research using the framework helps us both understand what I call cultural stasis, that is the the the, the fact that culture tends to be quite resilient to change. Um, and then another set of studies which gave us insights into processes of, of cultural change. So what, what is what might stimulate change in culture? Um, what might be the starting point? Mm -hmm. how, how might that then flow through to consequential changes? Um, I've not actually looked specifically at the idea of a meta-analysis in relation to energy efficiency efficiency interventions, but you could be right, there could well be enough. There's quite a few, like it, although it has been applied to a lot of different topics, it, it still is mostly applied to energy related um, studies um, of one sort or another. Um, maybe it's a good project for a master's student. Thank you for yeah, your no <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and a very special thank you to Janet for this brilliant presentation. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we are three minutes past our closing time. Janet, are you happy to share your slides with um, everyone who participated? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And the title of your upcoming book is? 
culture and sustainability. I will definitely look, keep an eye out for that. We're getting many comments of praise and thank you in the chat section. Um, as an evaluator myself, I got a lot out of your presentation, Janet, and um, I look forward to reading your book and to applying so, um, the cultures framework into some real life, real life um, practical evaluations. So um, yeah, we're all very grateful. Um, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining in and for participating fully.